Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark, and it's chapter 10. I'm going to be reading verses 46 through 52. And the, the he that's being spoken of here is Jesus. And this is what it says. And they came to Jericho, and as he was going out from Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he began crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and called and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take courage, arise, he is calling for you. And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and began following him on the road. Pray with me. Lord, breathe on us gathered here that these words might not just be old words in an old book, but that your spirit may flow through them into us and begin to transform, transform our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This story is a story about Bartimaeus, which may not seem like a strange thing, but it is. There are not many stories in the Bible where we know the name of the person who was healed. Not many at all. And this one, we not only know his first name, we know that he was the son of Timaeus. Well, this was an important story to the early church. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's a very important, that's an unusual thing for a story to be found in all three Gospels. But here it is. It's a story where Bartimaeus is a blind beggar who plants himself right outside the gates of Jericho. Well, Jericho was the oldest city in the world. Still is, I guess, if it was then, it still is now. It was the oldest city in the world, and, and it was a major trade route. So there was always a crowd, a crowd that, that went in and out. And that's where Bartimaeus parked himself, and he put his cloak. Now, we know that because it tells us that in verse 50. And that's not a throwaway word, that he put his cloak. That it was the cloak that staked out Bartimaeus' territory. And when he was calling for, for help, for anything, if a piece of bread hit that cloak, that, that space that he had right there, it was his. And it was enough to get him by for, for that day. If a coin hit that, then he was very fortunate, and there was enough to put with his bread. But there he was, with, 
in Jericho just scratching out an existence. A cloak was so important that if a, a poor man got a loan, whoever he received the loan from would take the cloak as collateral because that was the only thing that they had, and the law required that they return it at night. Well, why? Because the very poor, it wasn't just a cloak where they, they set up hoping to get, that was home. That was the only thing that, that would shelter him from the, from the elements, from the cold. That was the roof over his head. So here he was, parked in the, at the gates of Jericho, when he hears something. It's a multitude. Now, a multitude is different from a crowd. Whenever the Bible talks about a multitude, usually it's talking thousands. When Jesus fed the 5,000, it says that it was a multitude. Thousands were coming. And in listening to the thousands, maybe if he called out, he would get more than just a piece of bread that day. Maybe if he called out and called out loudly that, that thousands were coming, he'd get more than just one coin. Maybe there'd be more than enough for just today. Maybe there'd be enough for tomorrow or, or imagine enough for two days. That's something that surely would never happen. But instead of calling out for bread, instead of calling out for coin, when he heard it was Jesus, he called out for mercy. He called out for mercy, and immediately people told him to be quiet. I mean, after all, that Bartimaeus was a part of, of the class called the Amhaharats, is what it was called, the people of the land. And when you have pastures everywhere in the land, you don't need to draw a picture of what it meant to be a people of the land. It was what was there on the land. They were the lowest of the low. Probably the only thing lower would have been a leper because they didn't even get to stay within the gates of the city. I mean, and this is the lowest of the low calling to a, a rabbi that had thousands following him from city to city. They told him to be quiet. But still he crawled, called out the louder when he heard that it was Jesus. Have mercy on me. And Jesus said, call him here. And then in verse 50, it says, and he cast off his cloak. The only thing that he had in the world, he cast it away. And when he went to Jesus, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, receive my sight. And Jesus said, your faith has made you well. And so he followed him. Here's a story where Bartimaeus, verse 47, he heard that it was Jesus. He responded in faith, and he followed. Well, no wonder this was an important story for the early church. It's a story of, of hearing, of responding in faith, and following. This was a story they could tell to their children, to their grandchildren, to their neighbors. It's a story to remember the, the hearing, the responding in faith, and the following. But it's a story that starts out like a lot of stories. Not with good news, but with news that isn't so good at all. One needing mercy. The lowest of the low. The desperate. And maybe it's at that point. Dealing with this pandemic... Dealing with our current political crisis. Dealing with what's going on. I, we're at a low point. Nobody needs to tell us different. But Jesus doesn't respond with more bad news. He responds with good news. The best news we've ever heard. And that now is the best time. Now is the best time to listen. Now is the best time to respond in faith. And now is the best time to follow. That it's in the interruption. That it's in the, 
the despair, that it's in the low point, that it's in that time that, that we have opportunity, and maybe we're more aware of it than ever before, that this is the time. This is the best time to listen, that this is the best time to respond, and this is the best time to follow, to follow Jesus. God does it again and again in the Bible. Moses, he was at a low point in his life. He had been a prince of Egypt, but now he wasn't at all. He was tending his father-in-law's sheep in the fields of Midian. Jethro was his name. They weren't even his sheep. He was tending Jethro's sheep. And that's when he, he saw a bush that was on fire, but not being consumed. And in Exodus 3, verse 3, it says, And he turned aside. That he turned aside to see what this great thing was. And that's where God spoke to him. It wasn't that there happened to be a burning bush and God just happened to be talking. It was when he turned aside that the interruption, that the low point, that that's the time in the everyday, in the ordinary, when days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months, that's the time to listen. That's the time to respond. That's the time to follow. David, he was doing what he, he was supposed to. He was delivering lunch to his brothers there on the battlefield. In the Valley of Elah, he was delivering lunch, and that's when he heard it. Down in the valley, someone was taunting the armies of God, mocking the armies of God, of the living God is what it says. And that's when David had an opportunity to keep doing what he was doing or, or step on the field and be used as an instrument of God. Jesus tells a parable about a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he falls among the thieves who beat him, strip him, and leave him half dead. And it's in that story we hear some passed by. And it's in that story we know the Good Samaritan because he responded. He responded. This morning we have a story. A story that calls us, that leads us, that points to Jesus. And not just what's natural. It calls us to a power beyond ourselves. There are a lot of stories about the Taj Mahal. I like a story that, that, that Max Lucado refers to. The Taj Mahal was built by the Shah Jahan in the 1600s. Shah Jahan built beautiful things. From the time he was 16 years old, he built beautiful things. But the Taj Mahal, it was going to be the crown jewel of all the things that the Shah had ever built. It was going to be the world's most beautiful building, and that's what Taj Mahal means, most beautiful building. He was building it not just to be the most beautiful building, he was building it for his favorite wife. She had died, and it was built to be a mausoleum for his dead wife. A lot of folks don't know that the Taj Mahal was built to be a mausoleum. Well, it turns out that the Shah Jahan had to buy four or five palaces and the land surrounding them in order to, to build the world's most beautiful building. And once he had established the parcel of land, in the very center of it, he put his wife's remains, his, her coffin, so that all who worked on the world's most beautiful building would be able to look and see for whom they were building this world's most beautiful building. Well, the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months. And one day the Shah Jahan was traveling from one side of the work site to the other and his leg brushed up against something, not knowing what it was. He called his men to dispose of this box that he had brushed up against not knowing he had ordered his men to dispose of his wife's remains. And it's parable how we get caught up when days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months and how we get caught up and it's so, so natural to get caught up and we lose sight of what's essential and we fall into what's, 
what's only important. It's been an easy thing to do here in this, this pandemic to turn in on ourselves, to circle our wagons, to think about me and mine, and not to reach beyond ourselves. The invitation has been every week in worship to go beyond what's natural, to listen, to respond in faith, to follow Jesus, and to let folks know that they matter to God and that they matter to us. It's a time, a time to listen to the Spirit of God within us, a time that God has has used to give us a shake, a time that God has definitely used to give us a nudge. It's a time where God can use it if we allow Him to give us a thump on the head. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. That it's not just a time to to scratch by. It's a time to sit down with Jesus and to listen and to speak and to dine with Him. Not a drive-by, but to dine with Him. This is the best time. Now is the best time to listen. Now is the best time to respond in faith. Now is the best time to follow Jesus. When I was in college, I uh, would sometimes go to church with some friends. There was a church that they liked a lot, and the, the, the preacher there was a really great communicator, very good communicator. And I began to notice that just about every time that I heard him preach, he would set up a, a straw man. That This is who we're against. It, w- it would be an, an enemy. And then it, there that Sunday, every Sunday, he'd shoot it down. And, and people in the congregation, they, they would follow him because, you know, they knew what wrong was, and it was whatever straw man that he set up that particular day. And in my journal, I wrote it down. I said, some people are made strong by the enemies. They fight. And it's because I wrote it down that I kept going back to it. Sometimes you don't know what you think until you see what you say, you know? And, I, and, and because I'd written it down, over the years I kept going back to it. Some people are made strong by the enemies that they fight. And then I began to think about it. You know, my father's generation, that there was World War II. They knew who their enemies were. They had to, to band together. The enemies, they wore uniforms. And we knew that that if if Hitler and the Nazis weren't an enemy, then what do you need? There must be something wrong with you. And the way my father put it is, is if we didn't band together, we'd all end up speaking German. And he was right. He was right. We lived in a world where we, we knew who the enemy was. We knew us and we knew them. And we could band together. We could join together. After World War II, we knew who the enemy was, the Soviet Union. They had parked atomic missiles, they had the atomic weapons, missiles, right there in Cuba. And they weren't just pointed somewhere in general, they were pointed to Lockheed Dobbins in the Naval Air Station. We practiced those drills, duck and cover. Lots of my friends had fallout shelter. We knew who the enemy was. Folks drew together because we had a common enemy. It seems like since the fall of the Soviet Union, maybe more than ever, we've been looking for enemies. In politics, folks have been looking across the aisle. At other times, they've been looking to other groups across the state, across the the nation for enemies, somebody to keep us strong. And we know who they are. There's an us and them. There's an enemy and an ally. It's natural. But it doesn't just go back to World War II. I mean, when God turned to to Adam and says, what have you done? He said, that woman you gave me, it's her fault. 
Then went to Eve. What have you had? The serpent deceived me. There's always somebody we can point to that with a worst record that divides us and them, and we can feel good about ourselves. It's the most natural thing in the world. But at the risk of sounding like Captain Obvious, Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. And if anyone knew persecution, if anyone knew hardship and heartache, it was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul had been beaten with rods. He'd been beaten with whips. He'd been thrown in jail. He had had his friends desert him. And from jail, he writes, in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Anything worthy of praise... Jesus Christ gave His life on the cross for you and me. He's worthy of our praise. That Jesus did what the worst, most despicable enemy in the world cannot do. He took your sin and mine, not just so we would overlook it, but so He could wipe it away and take away its power once and for all. Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise because what He did on the cross for you and for me. Jesus Christ rose from the dead to give His power the power of His Holy Spirit to you and to me to live within us, to give us strength that we don't have so we would not do what's natural, to pick out an enemy to make us feel better, to divide us and them, to figure out who's the worst so we can be good. We don't need an enemy so we can follow Jesus. We have the power of His Spirit available to us now, today. And now, today, He's calling us to what is true, to what is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, whatever is of excellence. And you know, you know what's worthy of praise. His name is Jesus. And it's why you're here. That we might listen. That we might respond in faith and follow. This morning, I'd like to give an invitation an invitation that over the next three days that they be for for all of us a time of prayer and fasting. We live in a broken world and maybe it's more obvious to us now than ever. Folks are hurting. We're hurting. And we want to do what's most natural But Jesus has power we don't to call us beyond what's most natural. And I want to invite you to a time of prayer and fasting during the next three days where you find one meal a day that you fast, that you go without. And if you go without a meal, guess what? You'll get hungry and you find out what makes you grumpy in this life. You do. And you begin to listen, starting with self, in asking for repentance. And then we move beyond to a world that needs to know who Jesus is. And we become Christ, Christ for the world. This world needs to know who Jesus is, and, and you may be the only, the only reflection they ever see. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, breathe your Spirit on us.
that this day, transformation may begin not with somebody else, but with us. That we may listen, we may hear your voice. We may respond in faith and follow. Lord, grant us the strength of your Spirit. Not one day, but this day, now. Now is the best time to listen. Now is the best time to respond in faith. And now is the best time to follow you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.